That putting books out that includes hope is dangerous. I thought it was just... In 20 years where we know the placebo effect works, we know from the work that Simon and Gola have done how you can increase um, survival rates uh, big time, that nothing goes so far into the orthodox medical field where people are treated not as a, as a method of healing. They see it as some kind of psychological extra for people who can't cope well. Mm. That's good. But for me, it's a healing source, how to think better. <clears throat> and that is a message that I would have for everybody. Mm. We all grow up with think th thought processes, with belief systems, they are good, and some are really not good. Yeah, well, look, I, I came across a thought, a thought process that I was just today that I knew, but that I'd have forgotten. It was a very simple one. Okay. Very, very simple. Uh, this chap was saying that um, we often say, I can't afford this, or I'm spending money. But he says, I'd like you to try something different. Say you're circulating money mm -hmm. yeah because what circulation endeavors to express is the idea of return and sharing and sharing that's right and so this idea and so today i spent a little bit of money you spent it yes i spent some money <laughs> you didn't circulate it <laughs> but hold on hold on i spent a little bit of money but it was quite funny because that idea of circulation was fresh in my mind and i had a friend with me and I said to the chap at the store, Rembrandt, it was, I said, um, I said, look, I, how much would I be circulating here if, if that, and he gave me the price and everything. I said, well, that's not so bad then, is it? And I thought, oh, I love circulating. <laughs> no, but it was, it was just a little, you know, that framework. Now, of course, obviously, you just picked up on the fact that I haven't embedded this into my psyche yet, but it's a lovely way to be. It's, it's, it's wonderful. And, Actually, the language is a fantastic indicator of where you are at. Absolutely it is. For example, when you said that's not that bad, is it? Mm. That is already a missed chance. That's, you could, if you ask a New Zealander how you are, the classic answer nine, nine times out of ten is not too bad. Yes, that's right. And I actually, I mean, we talked before about... Um, Changing beliefs. Mm, changing language is the secondary. Changing language. Is a and I act. had, I was once in a, in a men's group, and that was during a time when I was had treatment, and guys would ask me how you are, and I said, look, maybe we have to clear that up once. I have days when I feel shitty. But once you ask me, I don't want to say I'm, I'm, I'm feeling shitty because it's not good for you, it's not good for me. So how can I word that honestly without be getting negative. And there was one guy who came up with a fantastic answer, said, once I'm asked in a situation like that, I always say, there's room for improvement. <laughs> so these days, if you would ask me how I am, I said, um, Charles, pretty good with room for improvement. Mm. Then you know the story. And in a way, it's true. Most of the time, it can definitely be worse too. Yeah, it can be better. Well, that's the thing, you see. I mean, you know, a pair of shoes can be a good pair of leather shoes. Yes. But they need a polish. And so I consider myself to be a pretty good leather shoe. Yeah. I wear out well, just like everybody else. But, you know, now and again, I'll get the cloth out and shine myself up. Mm -hmm. That's when I'm most aware. <laughs> that's right, with your positive <laughs> shirt on. But actually, I was having another conversation today. Funny, I've had... Conversations galore. Uh, just uh, fun and funny enough, you were the stimulus of it because I was talking. Was I? Yes, I wasn't even there. I know. Isn't it amazing <laughs> the power you have? <laughs> 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 the power you have without even being present. But uh, we, I was talking about the the role of positivity and um, happiness, and I think I've alluded to this al already. But I don't like the word positive. No. 
it doesn't have to be. No. And actually, I would ask, like to ask you a question. Yes, go ahead. What is for you the difference between contentment and happiness? Well, I'm going to be honest with you. Yeah, yeah. And, and, well, give, and, yes, and, like and, that. and give you an answer that probably doesn't answer it as... as uh, uh, just... No, no, but, I, th but I think it's important it. to clarify it a little bit. You see, I have spent a long time removing both of those words. Both. Because I have a balance in my life, and I know I've had to get the balance. It's been a long time coming, but I'm very close to getting it in a, in a good way. Um, I had a lot of psychological issues after Wilhelmina died. A lot of depression, a lot of anxiety. I had a moment when I was such a victim. And if it hadn't been for Jordan Peterson, I wouldn't have turned myself around. You know, and I loved what he said, you know, you're a victim, you're a victim, you're oppressed, you're oppressed, goodness knows why. You're and he went throughout, throughout this university and pointed the finger at all these kids in university. They're in university. They're not oppressed. <laughs> right? You know, mm -hmm. that's yeah. a privilege. Education is a privilege. So Yes, it absolutely is. Yes. Right, now. He's, he's, he said these words. He says, and of course, we're going to fix all of your problems and all of your problems and all of your problems. He says, and we're going to create a hierarchical value system in which we take the most oppressed thing about you and anybody who's got that bit of oppression, we're going to address that first. And then he said this, and then you've got to say, who decides mm -hmm. and he says that's the bloody thing mm -hmm. who decides what value is your oppression you're a man with one leg you can't walk you're a man with no arm you can't work a certain thing well what one do i decide is the most oppressed is it the no arm guy or the no leg guy who decides i mean and, and he, he used a number of other categories you know I'm I'm a single man. I'm an unattractive man. I'm a, you know in, all through. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm a I'm a religious man. I'm a non-religious. So in all these categories, that was the beginning for me, because I realised that I was looking at the wrong things to manifest the values that I most wanted in my life. I didn't really care if happiness was available. At that time, I just wanted to function. Yeah. And in terms of contentment, <clears throat> I didn't even know what that was. But I needed to have something to move forward to. Yeah. So the thing I moved forward to was, and I've said it before, does it have meaning? meaning. Yeah. Is it useful? Yeah. Those two things became the fundamental premise upon which all my life is based. Yeah. Now, do I get it wrong? Do I do use un um, useless things? Do I do I don't do I uh, am I not always embedded in meaning? Of course. So, and I'll, I can I can address that too. I can find meaning now. In everything I do, because everything I do matters. That you could say, in that you could say there is contentment. Yeah. Because I find meaning. And I'm in the process of finding, one of the reasons why I have these conversations, the most useful truth today. Those two things are fine. They make me function on a very high level, higher than I've ever functioned before. Because if I have meaning, I go forward. Yeah. If it's useful or an even more useful truth or more useful belief, the thing that manifests most of my life, the meaning, will become it will become effervescent and bubbling and vivant. I will live in a vibrant attitude rather than wondering whether or not I'm getting enough contentment, enough happiness. No, then it, it just happens. I mean, then it just that's right. It's the manifestation yeah. of being rather than the manifestation of a of a wish that you hope that your life would be that much happier. 
But you asked the question for a reason. Yes. Contentment. For me, it's it's a it's a clear difference between happiness and contentment. For me, happiness are exceptional moments in life. They come and go, mm. and they come as a gift. It's fleeting. Yes, you can't say now I want to be happy. <laughs> That's yeah, right. it's um, plug that in. Yes, I order three <laughs> cups of happiness. <laughs> Fresh out, I take it. <laughs> yes, that's right. <clears throat> um, so ha happiness is something special that happens as a byproduct now and then of contentment. And with contentment, having bring bring up my mom again, to realize you can work on your thought processes to find meaning, to find things you can be grateful for. Mm. For gratefulness, that is the thing that I really learned through my mom. If you're grateful, in that same moment, you can't be pissed off. It just doesn't work. But also, if you're grateful, you've found meaning. Yes. That's, that's it's, exactly it's, that. It's, 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 it's like there is an inevitability about gratitude and meaning that are inseparable. They're almost a synergistic set of values. And you, I, <clears throat> I believe you can, like my mom did, you can set that thought process mm. in motion. The book Any ended time. day. The book ended day. That's such a good thing. Any time you can mm. change. If, if I'm really pissed off and I'm aware of it, mm. oh, I'm not really feeling great, I can decide to think differently. For me, that was such a discovery that I have a, a lever there. Mm. I don't have to stay long term in negativity or depressed states of mind. Or, yeah, I, I have a different choice by thinking at different things. So, I mean, obviously, you found found your way through those really difficult times once your wife has died by probably practical experience, if I do something meaningful, I feel better. And if, if we could say something to people right now who are not feeling that great, what would be a possible of approach, a possible approach of feeling better, my way would be to say, look for thoughts, they feel better. What would be, for you, obviously, you had a different, um, you would maybe say, look for things they are meaningful. Or look, maybe look for things you can be grateful for, like my mom did. Well, I, I mean, think, that's, that's I a think, classic, because yeah. I, I do believe in every life, I think it's very, very rare that a life is just shit. I think most lives are a combination of good and bad things. They are. I mean, and then I mean, if we focus do... on the stuff that's really mm. enjoyable. By the way, with grief too, mm. I found that quite remarkable when my brother died. I mean, for a mother, a pretty, pretty hard thing. Mm. How good her thought processes were around that issue. She was actually grateful with his super difficult life that he was able to go before her because she would have been really afraid if she died, there would be nobody there to care for him. That's an incredible positive thought, yes, isn't it? Because it, it's associated with the gratitude for death. Yeah. I, I want to share with you just something about it. In 1995, I had a friend die. His name was uh, Dion Kayum. And I'll say his name because I know some of the people listening to this will know him. <clears throat> and I was at his bedside and alongside him was my wife. Well, she wasn't my wife at the time, but uh, my girlfriend. And then there was another lovely lady called Afi. There was a guy called Alex. And then there was his mother. Uh, and there was, uh, oh yeah, and Chrissy. Chrissy, you were there too. And Afi was a nurse. And she felt his heart go. And what she did immediately was to look at her watch and say he passed at this time. His mother did this. Praise God in heaven for thy mercy upon my son. 
thank you for the blessing of his life in my life. Mm. And, he, and she said, thou hast taken his pain, and as a result, thou hast taken mine. Yeah. Wow. She didn't say, poor me. She praised God and thanked God for the blessing of his life. Died at 27. Yeah. AIDS. Yeah, that is, <clears throat> that is what I... Uh, uh, sorry, just an interruption. Whether you believe in God or not, and I'm not talking about you or me, one, whether one believes yeah. in God or not, at that moment in time, that was such a useful tool. Yeah, absolutely. And it was all embedded in gratitude. Exactly. And it was all embedded in meaning. His life had meaning, though it was cut short. Mm. She was grateful for everything that he was, even the stuff that she wondered why his son. Yeah, had to go that early out. Well, mm. I mean, he he died HIV, and she didn't want his son to go away. She didn't want his son like that. And she, you know, she, I remember Dion. He stood before the congregation, you see, mm. and he looked up and he said. I've sinned, he said. He was skeletal at this point. And he got up. He just wanted to give his final talk. He knew he was going. To. And he said, oh, God, have I sinned. And inside me, I wasn't looking at him with shame. I was looking, God, aren't you brave? Yeah, and honest. And honest. You know, because he was something. And that brings me on to another thing, actually, about honesty. Now, I'm not... I'm not saying that sexual permissiveness or anything else is sin. But at that moment in time, he looked at himself as being someone who hadn't lived the commandments of God. Mm -hmm. yeah. But not that I want to dwell on it in, in that way. But here was the deal. His sin was manifested in the physical. The difficulty he faced mm -hmm. was something he could not hide. Yep. He was skeletal. The effects of choices that he'd made and the effects of others in his life were so manifest with a cane beside him as he went up to the pulpit to give his final talk was such that what do you do? Do you say sinner? Yes, I mean... We no know, one would, would we? No, I mean, Jesus no one, said who throws the, the first stone. Curse stone yeah. you know, let me go. But here's the deal. We should be able to accept people when they're not in the skeleton state. Mm. To be able to say to you, you know, Martin, I can see that you're human and the reason why you've manifested some negativity in your life, why the scars of your 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 um, metaphysical skeleton are apparent is because you're human. Yeah, and we get, I do believe, I mean, if you believe in reincarnation, then you could ask, why would a child choose to be amongst parents in a country where there's war and, you know, they are bombed and a lot of kids die? Why would they do that? I always believe our destinies are linked and it has an impact on people around you. Mm. And I can see that with my life by being affected by cancer. I had to learn a few things. I had to change a few approaches in life. And that brings me to the usefulness and that's the reason why I want to write the book and um, make a few videos myself because I was forced to learn otherwise I would die pretty quickly mm. and I think that some of the things I learned there they have been very useful for me and maybe they could be useful for others who don't want to get cancer or who haven't got cancer and, and may still profit from a different way of living your life fuller and more aware and do conscious choices about what 
beliefs you want to uh, uh, manifest in your life? Because and- I'm really aware of the fact that, you know, bitterness can canker. Bitterness is, let, is in, in the essence, is wasted life energy. It is. It is wasted life energy. And I, but I think I have seen people who are sick, but they're sick in their bitterness. Oh, yeah. I mean, and, and there are healthy people who are sick in their bitterness too. Yes. It's, it's what I hope what my life can demonstrate is you always can choose your, what you want to believe in. Mm. If you want to believe in victimhood and bitterness, mm. by all means, do it. Mm. But it, it doesn't lead to a fulfilled life. Mm. Uh, it's difficult for the people around you. You can build nothing. Yeah. There's one more thing that I, <laughs> that I did when I was um, – what, what I want to mention – Directly after the oh no, I think five years after the diagnosis. When we when were the kids born? When the kids were born, although we actually made an attempt not to have kids, um, I'm super happy that I was those you guys know what? overruled you know what? The, me just, there. Can I just say that that's actually one of the funniest things, you know. We we tried super hard not to have kids. You know, it's it's kind and of they like just the, wanted to come. Yeah, that's it's, it's I of, I deeply believe in since I believe in reincarnation, they wanted me and my wife as parents, mm. and we could do whatever we wanted to. <laughs> How Saskia is born is mathematically not possible. Mm. Yeah. Well, How she sneaked in there. I have the utmost respect for her to do it. Did the, and it made did the us, sperm must have traveled through the <laughs> ether or something. It made me super happy. Yeah. But anyway, what I did once both kids were there, and it was still not quite clear how long I would live, what I did, and I would really encourage a few people, maybe because we are all mortal, I did a video for both kids. Right. And told them how important they are for me and mm. how much they encourage me to stay alive and um, uh, how much I love them. And um, in case I die earlier than I want to, they have something where they can remind themselves. They have dad that really loved them. Yeah. And I, I have heard from those courses where I went to that some people, they haven't got an audio um, a video or something where they hear the voice. Yeah. The only thing they have got is the answering machine and then they keep that as the only yeah. audible voice message from them. Anyway, I think, and I will do another one now. So obviously now they are young adults and I think... Um, 20 and 23? They're 20 th- 24 and 21. Yeah, 21. And I want to do an update and the first part will stay there whenever they need maybe to remind themselves. Mm-mm. They have that option. And then I will, a little bit like what, what we are doing now, I will tell them what my beliefs are, what I changed and what I regarded as really important that I changed mm. my belief, um, what I regard as healthy beliefs in life, um, and make it very clear they don't have to share those beliefs, but they just, that they can see they had a dad who worked on his beliefs, yes. who spent quite a bit of effort to make himself a better believing person. Mm. And with, hopefully, with, um, they can see that it made me. Uh, uh, I love what you said. And I want to do another thing, a very funny thing. What do you want to do? I want to have a speech on my funeral. All right, your own. Yes. Yes, good on you. I want to be there and tell people, you know, there were always these speeches where people tell how great I was, and now I will tell you what I think about myself. (laughs) (laughs) And then I would like, in the end, we'll encourage people and said, you know, some of those near-death experiences, people said, you're still floating around and see the world from above. And you would do me a great favor if you just wave at me heavily. (laughs) 
And just the pure thought while I do that video yeah. that he will do that for me makes me incredibly happy. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think, you know, funerals should be a celebration of life. They should be fun. They should be, oh, hopefully people are a little bit sad to lose somebody. Well, to be honest, there was, a, I can't remember if it was 600 or 800 people at Wilhelmina's funeral. Wow. Yeah, there was a load of people there. <clears throat> and there was about, I don't know, three, 400 who stayed for the party afterwards. Apparently the um, Mormons that were high up in the VIP kind of thing didn't like the idea that I had a jazz band playing at the... Ooh. And I sang a song for Wilhelmina and we had a projection of Wilhelmina on the back wall, um, which was of all the children. And she was singing uh, uh, Both Sides Now, ah. the Joni Mitchell song. Mm. And... Um, but, but Wilhelmina said this for her funeral. No one must wear anything other than colour. Now, it was an exception for Māori because Māori apparently traditionally wear black. Okay. And so there was an exception made. But anybody else who didn't have that as part of their framework of yes. reference, they would wear colour. Yep. And so, you know, I came in a blue suit with an elephant tie um, and there's lots of people wore uh, yellow and red and stuff. Anyway, people danced, and I told so a funny wonderful. yeah, uh, told a funny story about how we met, um, which you can hear on. Uh, I can't remember which, which one can you hear? You can hear it on another podcast I did, um, but it was an interesting thing. And I, everybody else said they had never been to a funeral like it. Now, I think this is significant because if somebody's death can be a celebration of life, yeah. then the meaning of life is what is celebrated, not, not the value that's been lost. Yeah. You've actually gained value yes. in the death. And I think that is, if we can turn a loss into grat gratitude what we had, mm. I see that with some people around me that have lost their long-term partner and they're not able to do that. They are really still a few years later super sad about mm. the loss mm. that is natural but i do believe like my mom could do with my with my brother to turn that into gratitude what you had yes and that lifts still in you well you, you see the thing is is that especially if you've got children the manifestation of that exactly. other individual is is living yeah um and and i i just loved this yeah 2018 uh, we just moved here about the, the end of uh, 2017. And I was, I don't know, it was the last year of my eldest daughter's uh, school. Well, as you know, it was, it was uh, Indra's yeah. last year. And I said this once, I was driving her somewhere. And I said, I know some people might say that, you know, you've lost your mother. And this is what, this is what she said, Sasha said. I might get this slightly wrong, but she said, I don't feel like I lost my mother. I feel like I had the privilege of having. It's exactly that. You know, and I, I mean, this, this, is, an, better than this that. is an 18, 19 year old daughter, you know, who has got this uh, thing. I'll tell you another story. So I was taking. Oh, wonderful. It, well, it was just beautiful for, for me. I, um, I'm just going to check on the camera. I'll cut right here. <laughs> I may not cut. <laughs> it will just be a bit of a laugh. I thought I heard something click on the camera, but it's fine. I was taking my second daughter, Elena, to a piano lesson. And I asked her directly. Um, I remember this. I remember the Friday night so vividly. It was just her and I in the car, and it was two and a half years ago. I said, so I was taking her to piano lesson, 
or picking him up from the piano. Said, and I said, um, you know, do you, what do you think now of Mama? She's gone. It's been a couple of years. Um, and she says, well, I caught myself laughing the other day. Because I just thought of how we used to... Because all of them can sing in tune. All of them are great singers. I'll play you something later. Um, I said, but I remember how we used to choose some music that we could sing very well, but purposefully sing it out of tune. <laughs> that was the mess. That was the, me that was the memory. And she said, I just laughed. I laughed because here was the here was the thing for me. She wasn't focusing on everything she didn't have. Yeah. And even though she didn't say the word grateful, the mere fact that she was Could celebrating yeah. and laughed at the memory was the manifestation of the gratitude. That is that is exactly my main message for myself that I got mm. out of cancer. Mm. Don't see the restrictions. Mm -hmm. I had for, for, obviously I was a musician. I was playing in Frankfurt Radio Symphony Orchestra. And then at some stage I had to stop because my illness didn't allow me to keep going with my job. Mm. And for quite a while I, I could just see the loss And once people asked me, what are you doing? I had to say, I'm retired. I couldn't say I'm the member of the Frankfurt Radio Symphony Orchestra anymore. Right. So it sounded a bit different. Yeah? If you just say at an age of, don't know, late 30s, you say I'm retired, it's not a flash answer, right? <laughs> so for a while, I saw that being retired as getting money for doing nothing. And it took me quite a while to realize Not being a musician in an orchestra does not necessarily mean that my life is not as rich as it was before. I just have a different life experience now. Mm. And that is something that sits very well with me when you say, I want to be useful. I want to have give some meaning, not only for my own life, but that reverberates further. And I had, I think it's now two years ago since I had a conversation with a, fra a friend of Karin Boyke and we had a conversation which went into my life experiences with um, doctors and hospitals and mm. I uh, told a few of my stories. Mm. And he said in the end, Martin, you should write a book. You know, there is value in your life experience. Mm. You should share that particularly your thoughts about communication between doctors and patients, you have a very clear view mm. what is useful and what is healthy and what is not. Mm. And from your perspective, that is a real value that you could put out there. So to change my view about the deficit of what I couldn't experience anymore to what is value now that's just different and What your daughters are able to do is value the time that they had with their mother. Can I where, share another where thing? It just comes even in the present moment. That's it right. carries on. It, my third daughter, Freya, this was a while ago. Now, look, I want you to get this, right? This, this shows you – to me, this is such a gift because you said that uh, – we could carry on along this theme a long time and, of course, you know, But every time I think of this, I think of the miraculous. So Freya was 10 or 11? Or maybe maybe 12, but no, 10. No, t t gosh, it's five years. She's 15, she was 10. And Aurelia was eight, seven or eight. Now, two years between a 10-year-old and an eight or seven or eight-year-old is not a long time. It's not a long time. No. In the scheme of things. Not in the scheme of an adult. <laughs> yes. But listen to what, listen to what um, she said in terms of empathy for her younger sister. Sometimes I feel really 
um, sorry for Aurelia because she didn't have as much time as I had wow. with her mother. Yeah. Sorry, that made me a bit teary then. Yeah, yeah. Not that I'm crying over the... Not that I'm saying sorry for the tears, it's just... No. But such beautiful empathy. The fact that her loss was actually... Had such an... Was, was smaller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. In a sense. And she could feel for her sibling she very could strongly. feel for her sibling. Yeah. So... Each... Each one of my daughters has manifested a form of gratitude for their mother, for their new life. Hey, do you know what? <laughs> this will make you laugh. <laughs> it was about um, it's two thousand and it was two thousand and nineteen, and that year. I hadn't actually went out and spent a lot at Christmas. I'd been very frugal. Maybe I had the mind of cycling the money around. <laughs> yeah. You Circulate. didn't want to spend I didn't that want much. To spend it. <laughs> but I must get I'm going to get better at that uh, language because I think it's true but but I bought things that were quite little music boxes that were just this big that mm -hmm. weren't they weren't, you know, mm -hmm. not thousands of dollars. I bought everybody a little bit of this and a little book that spoke about being sisters. Lots of it was just meaningful stuff. Yes. And then I bought something that was quite special, a couple of special things. And then I bought it. It wasn't lots. It was small, significant and meaningful. And everybody got something that was similar but had a slight difference to it. And I left the room and the presents were opened and everything and I opened mine and what have you. And the girls turned to me at dinner. I think it was either the same day or Christmas Day was was the next day, Boxing Day. And they said, Pa, we were having a discussion we were having a discussion amongst ourselves. And we said that we had thought that Mama gave the best gifts. But we think you win that now. <laughs> <laughs> now, obviously, oh. it's not me. It's not saying, oh, you've got one no, of my no, 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 wife. No, 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 no. No, it's, it's this idea of the, th of the meaningfulness. The meaningfulness That's of the value that they had in the gifts, right? Now, don't forget, this wasn't... This is more like a new car or something yeah, like this. Yeah, no, it was it's the very meaningfulness. meaningfulness. And what they were saying was not devaluing my wife. No. They were saying, Pa, you really love us. Hmm. That's what I got. Yeah. That was my big gift. It didn't matter. I could forget any Christmas present. The oh. fact that they basically said, We know you love us. Yes, they got the message. Yeah. That was it. Why do you think it's a completely different complex of thoughts, but maybe I just You can let them go anywhere you like in this conversation. Yeah. I'm loving it. I'm aware I... that you and I might have a bed to go to. <laughs> <laughs> not the same bed. But... <laughs> no. <laughs> Preferably not. <laughs> I'm sure you're fine. <laughs> um Why do you think our species has still a lot of problem with sharing? The thing that really gets me is, have you ever seen penguins in a snowstorm? I know you told me about it. I'm fascinated. So for people on, who may yes. watch that, penguins in a snowstorm, 20,000 of them, they only survive because they share the cold and share the warmth. So they have a, make a massive circle from the outside to the inside, and then the people in the inside turn around and, and, and walk the, the other way around. Nobody with a megaphone, and nobody's cheating. Nobody just, just stays in the middle where it's nice and warm. 
the Oshirab. And that's my concern with humanness, that as a species, I think we haven't progressed that much in the last few thousand years. Well, I'm going to disagree with you a little bit. Okay, go, go for it. Because, I don't know, our species in our current format are between 250 and 300,000 years old, mm -hmm. in our current format. Mm -hmm. For much of the time, we were independent in terms of our food sources, etc. And it wasn't until around 10 to 12,000 years ago that we started farming. Mm -hmm. So it was really only at that point that we started to live in one area of life. You know, one, sorry, one yeah. area. And in some ways... We, it was a very new experience. It had never been done before. Mm -hmm. Okay, that was 12,000 years ago. Now, what we do know about human beings is they take a long time to change. They do. We know through evolution, billions of years, that the Earth and how strongest and the weakest survive or don't survive etc it took scientists they, they say it's between 13.1 and 14.3 billion years for for this solar system or or earth to be around or whatever it is I, I can't tell you since the big bang so we know things in terms of evolutionary processes take a long time We're quite comp complex because of our level of consciousness. I'm actually quite patient with human beings. The only problem that we have got is now with global warmings, maybe we haven't got the time to wait till we developed well, a bit more. I'm not so certain. I'm not so certain. Because looking at the work of Bjorn Lomberg, he says in, oh gosh, this is a whole other topic. And she, I know. <laughs> <clears throat> but Bjorn Longberg was, I think he was commissioned by the UN to do a study of the most important thing we could do to alleviate all the problems with climate change. Mm -hmm. He took economists, he took climate scientists and all mm -hmm. those kind of things. And the best thing that we could do was create economic growth for the poorest nations. Now, why is that? Because they did a study. If somebody earns around $6,000 a year or more, the environment starts to clean up. Why? Because the level of consciousness, you know, so for instance, if you've got sewage, if you've got a place to do a poo, you're not putting it in your water. If you've got a place to ex dispose of your rubbish, you're not putting it, you know, in your immediate environment. So he then looked at the time frame between, you know, 12 years that they say that we've got left mm -hmm. or yeah. whatever. And he says, look, even if you started to do all the things we were doing today, even if you thought that we could cut out everything today in terms of all global emissions, they will not make the best effects on humanity than helping the poorest nations, the poorest people of the poorest nations, become, well, earn more than $6,000 a year. Now, you might say, now you're looking at that and you're going, I know, you might go, Really? The, the truth is, is that the moment we adopt a policy of whereby we don't allow the poorer countries to have a coal mine, for instance, mm -hmm. we then stop their progress because green energy is really expensive. Mm. It's very expensive. And those countries need the infrastructure to be built in order to create that green energy in the first place. And there's a number of things that are happening that we think are good, but really when you look into them, they're not. For instance, here, look, the Paris Climate Accord. 
Now, it's quite a good idea to have an accord, isn't it? In principle, yes. In principle, yes. But everybody's playing by a completely different set of rules. China's, but, China's allowed to build... Is that all right? Yeah, yeah. I just see that there's a valve in there. I haven't I, seen that before. Yes, it's controlled by that little thing down there. It's, wow. It's, um, so you can choose between valve and FET, so you can choose the distortion. It's so warm here suddenly since <laughs> I realized it. <laughs> oh, so, no, I, I'm just adding to the, uh, to the CO2 versions. <laughs> um, but, you know, according to the Paris, uh, Paris Climate Accord, China is allowed to build, I don't know, what is it, 30 new or 200 new power stations, coal-fired, till 2030? But it, to me, it comes down to the thinking that we think too much into either egoistical thing, I need this, but I don't want you to have it, or to tribal thinking, I want my family, my religious group, my skin color mm. to have certain things and the others I actually would prefer not to. But I don't think that's widespread. That thinking? No. And I think it's only manifest in a minority of individuals who seem to have what we consider to have the power. But really, okay. Here's a summary. So look, this is what I think the real thinking is, right? The real thinking amongst people of peace which is the majority of the world. It's only a few who make the issues, make the problems. And I really believe... Look, here, here look. You're, you're German, aren't you? Yes. And I'm British. Mm. Well, you and I are supposed to have a history of problems, <laughs> aren't we? And yet, and yet me, I can love you, Martin, and Martin, you can yeah, love me. Yeah, that's true. And here's the deal. We live in the, on the same street. Mm. I'm not going to come around to you and say, Anything look what you, bang like on your you door. guys did. <laughs> look what you guys did. You know, yeah. I look at that as a moment in time. Now, look. I mean, in, in a way, we can only do our best in our environment anyway. Look, the fact is, you and I are saving the environment a plastic bag and trying to use as little of our resources as we can. And meanwhile, they're dropping uh, depleted uranium on the countries. Mm. Now, me using a plastic bag and them dropping deplete, depleted uranium and hundreds of tons of it. How about the fact that you and you and I, we put our recycling out. Mm -hmm. Well, everybody else, it would appear, is allowed to dump their stuff. Anywhere they like, especially if you are somebody who is a lobby group who, who lobbies a, a, some. But what what do you think now with um, global warming? If we believe the scientists, which I do, uh, then time is a crucial factor. And um, if according we, to Beyond Lombard, I mean, you you said now some examples yourself where behavior is done in a way that is long-term not acceptable or medium-term even or short-term short will cause trouble. How can we... So in my way of thinking is we are not developed enough as a species that we have automatically built in a behavior like the penguins. But, but, it, it goes, but, but it that's goes a for, level of consciousness, isn't yes, it? Yes, absolutely. But, and you see, the thing is, is that consciousness has to grow over time. Look, look think, think about this. Think about this. I know people talk about racism a lot, okay? France, in 1774, were the first country to abolish it. It was a white country. Mm -hmm. England, in 1806, they made their first start. Then 1816, they tried again. It became back in 1804, I think, for France, and then was fully abolished in 1848. Then England abolished in 1830, and then America 1868 or something like that, 1863, 1868, somewhere around there. And since two years, we have an English prince who married a lady with slightly darker skin. Yeah, okay. <laughs> that so, caused a lot of discussion. In the papers, in the papers, yeah. you and you and I were not going out and going, 
oh, she's she's <laughs> no. mixed race. You and I weren't. And I want to make sure that everybody knows, everybody knows that a majority of people are reciprocal and accept, accepting. It's a minority mm. of very loud voices mm. who, who magnifies the size of a but problem. Do you, but do you believe that is the same with... Um, a behavior that helps the planet to survive. Do you believe there too that it's the majority who consume in the way that will help the climate change to control? I think the thing is, is that you and I do our very best. And the only way we can do it is if we send the mm. message that as individuals, we take responsibility. You see, the thing is, is that, mm. look, you and I have to take responsibility for what we believe is the most useful thing that will manifest into our communities. Yes. Now, the problem is, we, and I was saying this to, on the Butters podcast, uh, on, to James Butters, he came for a podcast, I don't know if you know James Butters, but anyway, very good, good man. What you and I are doing is changing a world right now where we weren't able to do 15 years ago. Now, why do I say that? I'm not famous, nor are you. But for the first time in history, the common man and woman have a voice that can be sent to millions of people around the world. Mm. The power is slowly shifting. So what would you tell now your audience mm. through your podcast in terms of climate change? What I tell them is to take their own responsibility. And that right now, if you want the world to change, look, ever since I was a kid, I... No, we can only change ourselves. Right. So. Ever since I was a little kid, I never liked the smell of petrol. Mm -hmm. All right? Yeah. I remember, I remember just, oh God, it's, you know, awful and everything. And then they did unleaded. Okay. Started to change. All right. Now we've got this high octane stuff, which runs more efficiently. Now we've got more battery operated cars. Now we're starting to move. Look, we are slow learners. Nature is a slow learner. But do you believe that there, there may come a time when slow learning is too slow? We can do nothing about that slow learning, learning other than... I'll give you an example. The Gutenberg, the Gutenberg Revolution in terms of the printing press, mm -hmm. it changed the way in which we were able to be educated. Mm -hmm. People were able to read the Bible in their own language and en masse. What we're doing now is the greatest revolution since the Gutenberg Revolution because now... Now the common man doesn't have to read those that are educated. The common man can now educate. Mm, that's true. And so this is greater because how many people can read? Almost everyone? Maybe not. Yeah, but everyone But how can many listen. can speak and listen? Most, yeah. Right. Okay. So I don't know what I don't know what the truth is about everything. But I know what one thing. What's most useful to me? may not be the most useful to you, but if I manifest a truth that someone over there sees fit to implement and it changes the world for better, it has a ripple like never in bef never before. Mm. Never, never before in mankind has anything been more powerful than this. This is, this, this, okay, it might be seen by 40 people, it might be seen by 40 million, it might be seen by 10 billion. Well, actually, there's only seven and a half, <laughs> eight, nearly eight. But, but here's the deal. It's taken 300,000 years to get to a time when the common man has a voice. Power. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so, okay, are we willing to say, are we willing to say, okay, are we willing to take the risk? Because I'll give you an example. There was a man in Hungary that I was teaching uh, voice to. And he asked me, you know, he was 29. He said to me, how long does it take for to get a good kind of pop voice, a popular voice, a man like me? I said, three years. Three years? 
Yeah. I said, but I'll be 31. <laughs> and I said, this is true. I said, how old are you going to be in three years? I just said, he said, 31. Well, uh, how old are you going to be if you practice? What, in three years? I said, yeah, 31. How old are you going to be in three years if you don't? <laughs> 31. And he went, oh, I get you. Time will pass, Martin. Yeah. We can either practice or we can give up. Mm. Yeah. I mean, and I just sometimes feel for our children. They are confronted with um, a magnitude of challenge that we have never experienced before. And but you're right, I should be more encouraged by seeing how that new generation grows up, what kind of feeling they produce, like your your daughter, how she takes care of the feeling of his yeah. younger sibling. But but also how about how about that guy? I can't remember his name. Um his last name is Slat. I can't remember his name. It's from Sweden. He said within five years he'll clean up the oceans because he's built those barges. And they're also commercial, so it will make him some money as well where he can reinvest into making more barges that will go in and clean up the oceans within five years. Mm -hmm. 17 years old when he had the idea. Mm -hmm. Now, look, how about, how, about, how about this? How about, uh, now, look, I know Elon Musk is a f name that we always hear. He said the first venture into this Neuralink business, this the idea of inserting... Uh, a chip into the brain will create new neural pathways, electro, uh, ele uh, ele uh, electronic pathways, pathways, yeah. so that people who either have like dead limbs will one day, and very shortly, be able to send impulses and re-educate their legs. Mm -hmm. Now, that's new. The idea that people be able to walk again, and not with an not with an amputated leg, where did that? I mean, that's amazing. Mm. There are so many things. How about this? There's this guy called Manoj. I think his name is Biaskari. I can't remember. Indian chap living in America, and he created a bike where you pedal it for one hour, and it creates 24 hours worth of electricity. Mm -hmm. So you can run a computer, a light bulb, and maybe some heating. He shipped 10,000 of those bikes over to India. Now those poor individuals, their world has changed because one person in that family mm. pedals for one hour a day. Fitness, mm. light, and education, because now when it gets dark, they can keep the light on and they can read. Mm. So, how about this? Let's talk about the, the, the Tesla vehicles. Do you remember when the mobile phone used to cost like $1,500 to $2,000? You know, like the mobile phone? It was a big, mm -hmm. it was a brick. Oh, yeah. We had, we had, when we lived on the South Island, we yeah. had a monster of monster. those things. Yeah, well, Elon Musk has said the same thing about the Tesla car. He says, right now, it's $75,000. But one day, the market will increase. And it will be 50000 And now you can pick up a, a phone, for instance, at Countdown for 80 bucks. Mm. That gives you all the basics of a phone and it, and, and, it, and it works. Now, of course, you can spend on the Galaxies and you can spend on the Samsons, the, the iPods and the, sorry, the iPhones and everything. Mm. But you can pick up a phone that does all of that generally well for 80 bucks. So you are, I mean, I... <laughs> I would contradict myself if I would not get behind believing in hope because mm. I was very vocal about that before. Mm. Um, yeah, for some reason, I have it's interesting to discover that for me to, to, tonight. <laughs> for some reason, I haven't managed to be so hopeful about the consciousness of mankind. 
I'm con- I'm I'm hopeful because of this. Yeah. The, I don't know if you know. No, no, I, I I actually completely agree with you with one thing. I had for a while. I was regularly involved with conversations where, at some point, the whole negativity kicked in. Uh, nature is going to bits. Um, politicians are crap. Um, uh, everything was was bad. And after a while, I made it a rule for myself to listen for a while and then at some point to say, look, guys, you're right. There's some crap on the planet. But are you aware that thoughts and feelings are energy that feed that? Mm. So what we are doing right now here is by warming up all that negativity, we extend it. Mm. We throw, throw some oil on the fire. That's right. The problem Tonight, just in the last half half hour, got bigger because we fed it. And I think it's good for me to realize that I'm part of the feeding process. Well, look, but when it comes to... You said in the beginning that humans have an, uh, a, 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 an impediment, and that is that they see the fear and negativity yes. immediately. And it's built into our evolutionary pathways. pathways. And look, mm. Martin, it isn't unhealthy to recognize danger because it's the thing that springs us into moving forward into new areas of discovery. But we have to change our thinking process into some kind of productive thinking. But, and that and is, we have. And that, yes. <laughs> and now I, I just, for me, it was an interesting discovery. I mean, we are all on, on a pathway of yeah, developing. Yeah, yeah, and, I know. Uh, and I'm I, just, big... I just discovered a point where I could do better. <laughs> <laughs> well, look, look, you know, look, I have a terrible problem with loneliness. Have you? Yes. I have to work really hard. God, I just can't believe I what, just... what happens when, it, it, once you are lonely? What happens then? I'm just curious. Uh, a, a world of... Uh, my world inside my head does that and caves in. Okay. And there's an that's it's almost like an immobility. Okay. So I do work really hard. Yeah. I work exceptionally hard on not being lonely. I'm getting better at it. I'm getting better at it. I've spent I spent twenty years with my very best friend. Every now and again, the behaviours associated with loneliness looking for external things. It could be anything from alcohol yeah, yeah. to anything. They manifest. But here's the deal. And this is why I was talking about it. I have to have that learning. I have to have it. You have to have that moment when you're confronted by the thing that's your Achilles heel or your demon. Yeah, yeah we, we... we have to have it. I'm passionate about the fact that we have to have it. Yeah, you're right. Because unless we're willing to travel into the darkest areas, we'll never shine the brightest lights. But would you think that you have to choose the darkest places or do you think they are presented to you through the universe, through God or karma or whatever? Karma or circumstance. Yeah. You said, you know, I said before, pain mm. definitely leads to intense learning. Mm. There's just no avoiding. Mm. So there is a place for that. Mm. But I do believe, I mean, you said that before too, balance is a nice thing in life. Mm. So too much suffering, too not enough in joy. Yeah. And um, sometimes... I think we can do better in being joyful. The thought, how we are said before, that the bias towards the negative can lead to depletion of joy. Look, I think I spoke to you before. When we spoke a couple of weeks ago, I, I, I think I brought up two examples that Richard Curtis, uh, the director of Love Actually and the writer of Love mm -hmm. Actually had brought up. <clears throat> but I'll say them again. I'll say them again. He was talking to uh, a Channel 4 presenter, who I always forget the name of. But he said this, and this was a few years ago. He said, one soldier in, in reality goes off uh, 
and he rapes, he goes AWOL and he rapes a pregnant woman. It's all over the news. And it's, and it says, and the news says something like the, the sorry state of our, of our, um, of our world, you know. Mm -hmm. Now it's not untrue that that is a happening that happened. You know, that would, that occurred and there was a victim and there was a, you know, a perpetrator. But then he said, and, and, and that's what the papers say, you know, this is the sorry state mm -hmm. of the world. But then he writes a film called Love Actually. Yeah. In which he, I think it's like six or seven, maybe eight different scenarios that are completely silly and ridiculous of people falling in and out of love and finding connection with people of them. And the papers said an unrealistic and romanticized view of the world based in a fairyland or something and Richard Curtis said to this one soldier rapes a woman and we say that that is the reality mm. but I write a film about people falling in love and he says millions, millions. of people yeah, yeah. are falling in love every day <laughs> he says one child gets abducted sadly it mm -hmm. is the truth but they get abducted and that child is murdered, and we see that on the front page for four to six weeks. Mm. But we never hear of the 30,000 children that have been saved from malaria in the, in the worst parts of the world. Mm. A hundred years ago, London was smoggy, dreadful. Matter of mm. fact, in the 1930s, 40s, we stopped burning trees in the whole of the Northern Hemisphere, mm. and we started to burn coal. Mm. We have more trees in the Northern Hemisphere than we had 100 years ago. Mm. I remember we had, when we traveled with the orchestra, we traveled through Japan and had concerts there. And um, I haven't been in Japan at the time when the smog and air pollution was horrible but mm. apparently they had telephone cells where you could throw some coin in and breathe um, a few a few um, lungfuls of good air and then mm. hang up again yeah. and when i was there that, <coughs> the, the traffic was barbaric it was you know highways on top of yeah. each other was just incredible but the air was really good i was quite astonished about that you're right no, I, no, should, not, I should practice no, more. But, but I'm should. not completely right. Uh, I'm only partly right. Okay? That means you're partly wrong. Yes. <laughs> well, look, here's, here's the idea. Look, I, I mean, I remember listening to this, uh, <clears throat> it was Jordan Peterson, actually, who, who said, look, you know, if you, go, if you pick 100 people, 60% of the time, if you want to find the most aggressive one, 60% of the time you're going to be right, it's going to be the man. But that does give you 40% of the time you're going to be wrong. Mm. That's quite a big margin of error. I but, actually read somewhere that pessimists always claim that they are realistic. And they, they did a research, I think, that op optimists are just as realistic as, as pessimists. Well, yes. And, um, and you said before that um, sentence of... Um, Mr. Ford, who says, if you... No, you say you can, you say you can't. Yeah, you, know, yeah, right. yeah. you know, he was also confronted. I don't know if he was confronted by a reporter or confronted by a, a jury of some kind. I can't remember exactly what the circumstances were. And they concluded that Henry Ford was uneducated. And they asked him things like, do you know how um, carburetor works? Do you know how mm -hmm. this works or whatever? I mean, I'm, I might be wrong about all of that. And his answers all the time were, no, I don't. Actually, no, I don't know how that works. don't know how that works. Do you know how? But he says, but I know somebody who does. <laughs> and, and so I don't know how a lot of things work. But I'm not a scientist. I, I'm not a manufacturer of things or whatever. But through my own experience, yeah. I have a little inkling of what some tiny form of expertise can do. Yeah. And I like I like your idea about that new medium that just by putting out life 
experience. I mean, books can do the same thing. They and, can. And they have for me. Yes. That I, and I, I think then in some way, isn't that super cheap? Yeah. Like that book of Carl Simon mm. costs under 20 bucks. Mm. Changed my life. The magic of thinking big. How to win friends and influence people. Think and grow rich. And not. And by the way, all of these things weren't to do with money. Think and grow rich is about how you think. Mm. The magic of thinking big is about how you think. Mm. How to win friends and influence people is about how to think. Mm. And these people read these books. This Sorry, wrote these books. But that was 1950s for Dr. David J. Schwartz, Magic of Thinking Big. <clears throat> Andy Carnegie was maybe 100 years ago when mm -hmm. he wrote that book. We've been knowing these things about thinking and the importance of thinking for years. Yes. And I mean, <clears throat> but unfortunately, that's the consolation prize. You have to practice that. Yes. And that brings me back to my mom. That's what, <laughs> that's what I understood through my mom. Mm. She practiced it every single day twice mm. to the point that she could feel it. Mm. For me, that was the big lesson that I could see. You can actually learn it. Mm. I mean, we are all different. And some people by nature, maybe they have an advantage by being a little bit more in the positive field of thoughts and less in the negative. But that doesn't matter because the ones who are maybe have not the advantage, if they practice it, that's like sports people or music people or whoever, the, one who, the ones who do practice, they become experts. Here, here's something for you. You know, it would be terrible if we had equality, you know that, don't you? If we had what? Equality. equality. Let me explain why I said that. You're a good violinist, aren't you? You play well? You Reasonable. were playing in an orchestra? I, I was at some point okay? in my life. I played really well. Okay. You had value. Yes. All right. Some people only wish they could play the violin. Yeah. They're not willing to do the practice. Exactly. Now, here's the deal. In that thing is inequality. Yeah, you were willing to do the work. We will, now, here's always the, have, we will always have differences, and that's good. Yes, but it's unequal. Yes. It's unequal. It will be never the same. It'll never be the same. No. And you all play the violin. I mean, I used to play the violin. I was a grade eight violinist. I was very good at one point. And then the voice took over. <laughs> um, I've got to get my violin repaired, actually. But here's the other thing. You, you're from Germany. Germany is a landlocked country, mm -hmm. right? I mean, if Germany had a soul, so to speak, in terms of the, the country itself, I'm sure it would have loved itself to be by the sea. We have a little bit in the north. We have a yeah, little, little bit, bit in the north sea, yeah, yeah. north sea. Yeah. Little, but it would have been great if it had more access to the Atlantic, to the Pacific. Mm. But economically, uh, it it's hard to be a landlocked country. You have to use a lot of ingenuity and negotiation in order to send your goods through other countries round. Yet there's countries that have access to all the seas. Mm -hmm. It's inequality. <laughs> yes. There are some places where it has hills and the spring water runs down and it's fresh all I the mean, time. I mean, equality, maybe it's more equality of life. Let me see. Each life has the same value. And I actually would agree with that. But it will never be the same. It mm. means it will be not identical. No. But we will always be born unequal. Yes, but the same. I met once, maybe I have mentioned that to you already. I met once a lady. She was, at the time when I met her, she was 18, looked like 60. Mm. And she was super sharp still in her mind. And she had that philosophy that I copied for myself or adapted to myself where she said nobody's better than me and I'm not better than anybody else yeah. so that means any every person that you meet is on eye level mm. if that's a child mm. or a doctor or a, a bus driver or it does not matter mm. and I really love that mm. if you and if you believe that whoever just happen to pop in your life that can be the person serving you 
selling your newspaper or whatever. Mm. That person at that moment is the important person. Totally and right. And it yes. has the same value to you, mm. not above you and mm. not below you. Mm. And that was in, in, in hospital too, to actually… But you, but you, wait a minute, hold on. Let's, before we do that, you had doctors that were more valuable to you than the other ones. Not of life value. I, I responded better. I gelled better. Um, the connection was closer. But I will never go there and say, that other guy <laughs> was actually, okay, I didn't like him. That is something else to, than to say he had less life value than me. Okay, all right. So if we believe and we agree that all life has the same value, is there anything that you can do as a human being to devalue that value? If you have this value... Yes, I can. Okay, all right. I can behave like an asshole, yeah. <laughs> okay, but wait, 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 hold on. So wait a minute. Then there's an inconsistency. Because if you can behave better, does that then increase your... No, that is... I like, I like the style of philosophy. You can better be a better you than you have been the day before. Mm. So you don't compete against somebody else. No, you don't compete against else, anybody else. You, you always compete. compete against yesterday. Yes. Your, your yesterday. Yes. Yes. Exactly. But if you're saying that behavior can devalue that... that uh, it can cover the divine spark in us. Yes, it can. Okay. All right. So humans can be of a lesser value. I wouldn't say value. I would say they can... Stalin? They Chairman can. Mao? I yeah, like, read, what, <laughs> yeah, just, no, no, I'm, I, I'm just trying to... Because I, I believe that do, all humans are valuable because, yes. because they all have mothers. Yes. <laughs> right, and do you know what I mean? Do you, do, have you come across the, uh, what, the Conversations with God books? Yes, I have. Who were they written by? Um, Neil Donald Walsh. Yeah. And actually, I, I even did a workshop um, that he did in Wellington when I was still living on the South Island, and he had a big impression on me. He in his one of his those conversations with God books, he says Hitler went to heaven. That's exactly that. He says we we all have the same value. Even people we where you don't we absolutely are against what they did. Right. Yes. But what they what they not are, what they are. They are still humans. Mm. That doesn't and and then to think and that is where religion then can play. A positive or negative role. If we think that your behavior will determine if you go up or down after dying, I mean, what a thought! What a frightful thought! Well, I have something that it was written on my whiteboard in my bedroom. Okay. And it says, "Forgive everyone." Yes. For only knowing your past. Or forgive those who only know your past. Yeah. Because you see, today manifests a new me. I have the ch opportunity to change, not the past, but no. their life is centered in what I was. Yes. And so yeah. I have the opportunity, they may not know it. So this is why I have to live with me. Yes, and that I can change my <coughs> attitude towards to, that guy. Yeah. I did actually, I had a very special decision done towards that guy who gave me the first diagnosis yes, right, yes. in a way that I only years later thought, what a good thing for him to do because he pushed me so far off orthodox medicine mm. that I looked for something else. Mm. And I think two or three years later when I came from one of those courses and when I made peace with orthodox medicine, I actually went into the clinic and sat there, I think, for an hour just to see the guy pass on the hallway past me. I didn't want to uh, talk to him. I just wanted to see him in a forgiving way. I just mm. wanted, I saw that he was an older, elderly guy with gray hair and a little bit hunched over and small. And I saw him and I could see that he was suffering under that seriousness of his job. Right, yeah. And then I realized to those guys at that time, they didn't have any training in how to communicate that mm. well. 
Mm. He didn't do it well, but in an ironic way, it helped me. Mm. It pushed me so far off orthodox medicine that I learned an awful lot from a different source. Mm. But it was important for me to come there and just for my own, had nothing to do with him, but I just wanted to make peace with how he did it at the time mm. and feel good about how my life is now. It's amazing, isn't it? <clears throat> I would say that it's quite a new skill for me. Maybe you learned it, you know, 20 years later, 20 years earlier. Um, <clears throat> Charles, I had to learn it. Well, that's that's the thing. I, I, there was a very clear understanding. Yes. I can't afford negative feelings regularly. Mm. Mm. I go downhill. Yeah. But that's the... Tr it was a very but, rational decision. But it's I the can't afford that. You, that. Said, you said what he said at the time could be perceived as something... That was horrible at the time. Right, right. But you said you had to hear it. You yes, in, because, in sometimes because, in hindsight, yes. things have a meaning that you don't recognize That's at the exactly time. right. You know, somebody said to me last year, it's always about you. Now, I don't believe that statement because I, I manifest lots of outside of myself. But they were being quite specific. And they were talking about the interaction that I'd had with them. A lovely friend of mine in the UK. And I realized that within that reaction, even though I didn't like those words, it raised my consciousness of our interaction. And now, even if I'm not in communication with this individual, like daily, because I'm not, I think to myself, huh, I wonder how they're doing. Hmm. I wonder how life is happening for them. Now, sometimes we have to take those, those not very nice things yeah, we the, hear. Yeah, the nitty-gritty things. And they, they need have... to embed themselves in a soil, so to speak, the soil of our soul. What do you We're... do with them? I mean, you can either choose to get bitter about That's it right. and don't forgive and live for the rest of your, your days in shit with that and hurt only yourself. Yes. and But the thing is, is that <clears throat> I always remember that, uh, what is that phrase about... Um, about mushrooms, you know, they're kept in the dark and wet, and and they become fungus. You know what I mean? What is it? They they kept in the dark. In other words, something grows yes. even in the dark and the damp and the dank. Yes, and and it may just be a fungus. But I was I was thinking about I was thinking about this. You know, the way fungus grows. Mm. I was thinking, well. People eat mushrooms to have, and I'm talking about magic mushrooms, you know, to have a new experience, mm. to find a different place. So even the worst, the worst kind of mushroom, if you can yeah. see what I mean, has a purpose in finding new meaning. It, it changes. It, right. So, And the reaction of people to, to bad things change too. Right. So it's so finding question, ourselves in I the mean, dark. Yeah, the question is really, is there a place for bad things? And uh, the, 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 that, that sentence, I think there's a book written with that title, Why Do Bad Things Happen That's to Good right. People? Yeah. Yeah. That, that is, it's a real question. Mm. What is my, how, where is my belief towards bad things mm. and bad people in life? Pain, the bad things. Yeah. The circumstance we find ourselves in yes but I and then that the language too that language I, I remember i mean i said that sometimes because sometimes i like to to just say the word assholes <laughs> and <laughs> that sounds like and, my dad <laughs> <laughs> and i but i remember that when i was at the simonton first course he said that is a language that activates negative feelings in you you could say, that's a person that acts in a way I don't like, instead of, that's an asshole. And I found just, just the pure thought. I could use the language very differently. You could. I mean, sometimes I can just have fun saying now the bad that, word. Okay, okay. so that, you see, this is the thing, you know, Dame Helen Mirren, yep. she said this, 
And I and I was I really like it. She says I've got to the age where I realise now I should have said fuck off more often. <laughs> no, but but yes. I, and what I'm what I took from that was that I don't have to accept a way of thinking. I can say fuck off. Do you know? It's that. So for yes, instance, so for but instance, it, then it it comes to then. I don't think it's but, negative either. With me, it kicks in the intention why you say it. If you want to say that to hurt somebody, no, then no, no, maybe that's not, the point. that's not a smart idea. No, to me, if you it's want to have sex, will travel. <laughs> Fuck off. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Cop copulate, preambulate, or ambulate. <laughs> um, but, but really, look, it's, it's really, it's really the intention, and I think kids pick up really well on that. Mm. If you. If you have a bad intention, even if you... Yes, ah, I have true. a wonderful example for that. Mm. I actually went... For a while, I was um, working quite hard um, about the book from Marshall Rosenberg. Um, what's that? His, his language? Nonviolent communication. Yes, that's right. I, and there's a whole society now uh, called... Um, Oh, it's called about the lack of aggression. It's a non-violent. Yes, it's non-violent. Yes, he, on, he on, wrote he wrote those books. Yeah, and I absolutely love the concept mm. of the language, and mm. I absolutely hate the language that he proposes. Right, right, right. Yeah, and I went. I was fortunate enough on the South Island to attend to a meeting of a group who works for Yonks. Mm with that language and mm. that principles. And yeah. I went in the, in that meeting and felt really good and thought oh, that will be great. And then during the meeting, I felt less and less good and I came out and felt real shit. And I thought, what happened here? And it took me a lot of time to, to ponder about it. In my view, what has happened is the group really paid attention mm. To the words, to the sentences, to the rules, but their intention, why they talked to somebody in a certain way, hadn't changed. So it was a skeleton that was used. And Jesus would refer to that as the letter of the law, not the spirit of the law. Yeah, that was, and that was the reason too. But on that meeting, they probably had marvelous meetings mm. too. But on that evening where I was there, there was a tension between, particularly between two of them, mm -hmm. and they did their utmost to use the right words and the right sequence and the right semantics, and and it wasn't good. The mm. atmosphere wasn't good. Mm. Anyway, I absolutely love the concept, and I was very fortunate that I got introduced to those ideas um, I think one or two years before I had a fantastic thing happening in my family. In my family, that's now I and my cousin, we are the third generation where sharing in her heritage wasn't done well. Right. So my grandmother didn't do it well with her sister. Uh, my mom and her twin sister was not done well. And then... With my cousin and me, I thought we will do that better. And then through some kind of interesting um, adoption, I was sidelined from that. <laughs> I and, laugh. And, it's just... and for a while, I thought, Martin, it's just money. Doesn't really matter. And then I realized it's actually far more than money. It's how we treat each other. Mm. How we communicate or not communicate with each other, with each other that really hurt me. And then I had to practice that. It was really interesting that um, differentiation between demand and request. Mm. Because I wanted to ask her after uh, several conversations if when her adoptive mother would die, if she then would actually share with me, I knew that she would legally be not required to do that but just out of fairness if she would do it. And because I have worked 
with that book and those principles for months before we had that meeting, I was really able to not have a demand on just a request. Mm. And we had three long, fantastic conversations, really meaningful conversations where one was talking from the heart and the other was listening with interest. It was right. just great. Yeah. So I'm convinced that two of us finally in the third generation could solve a problem. Mm. It was, I'm really happy. That is one of the successes in my life. Yeah, yeah. It is something I'm really happy that the two of us could do it. Mm. And I'm convinced now our kids, they will get different things to learn. Mm. I like like the idea to, to make new mistakes in life. I think if you don't do mistakes in life anymore, you're not adventurous enough. Mm. Well, look, but I if mean, you I do the same that's right. over and yeah. over, that's yeah. poor. That's not well, learning. Look, I, 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 I can tell you, look, my dad married a woman who had one child. Sorry, let me go back a bit. My dad married a woman who had two children initially. Then he had four of his own. Those other two children were taken away and he was left with his four that were his and they never saw their mother again. And my uh, mother had a child. We got together and they had two more children. Now... My father had a nervous breakdown. And I'm going, wait a minute. Is this history again? It wasn't divorce, it was death. I'm left with four children. Wait a minute. And I had a nervous breakdown, just like my father. So I started to look at some things. A bit like counting your blessings. Mm-hmm. There's a few things that are different. My father at the age of 50, and he'd been taking them for a few years, was taking blood pressure tablets. I'm not. My father at the age of 50 had false teeth. I don't. My father at the age of 50 had sore hips and legs. I don't anymore. <laughs> um... And I started to see that, okay, I was looking at all the things that, okay, nervous breakdown, left with four children. That's where the good thoughts about DNA kicking, that's, you know? That's right. And I, I thought, well, what are other things that I'm manifesting that are my father's that are, are, you know, good things? And my mother's also, you see. One of my mother's things is that she was determined. I do believe... <clears throat> In the concept of reincarnation. Mm. And I believe we choose our parents. And mm. I, I think it's a wonderful belief to have that. Mm. You know, to be honest, it's very close to how the Mormons think about it. They believe that uh, the choicest spirits are left for the latter part of the Earth's existence, so to speak. And, um, you know, I don't consider myself a Mormon, but I do take delight in the odd bit of... Uh, of, of yeah, but that's exactly <coughs> you can choose. Yes, what right, you that's want. we can choose what you want. That's right. I find that so fascinating. Mm. I can choose. Yes, well, I'm that, never stuck. And uh, that's right. It's quite funny, you know. I was talking about um, talking about this idea of being stuck today, and I was saying to somebody, you know, I never thought of myself doing this. Never in my life it ever crossed my mind to do it. But I. But I could now never not think of doing it. Yeah, 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 that makes sense. <coughs> but isn't that marvelous? We change. We change. Do you know, I think we talked about it, we my favorite movie, Ratatouille. Yes, you did. Yeah, go on. You haven't seen it. Uh, no, I haven't. Yeah, but my children oh, have. Oh, we, yeah. we have to see it. We'll watch Trust it together. Me, we really have to watch it together. <laughs> okay, cool. Because there, there are quite a few of those things about... Mm. change in life mm. and identification what who you are and who you're not and mm. how people see you and how you see yourself and i think it's a just a wonderful movie we really should watch we, it. We should, i haven't we should watch. i haven't 
I haven't seen it in years. Yeah? No, I, I think the last time was just a year ago. <laughs> oh, was it? Getting it was, the scroll oh. system. <laughs> I have watched it, I think, 15 times. All right. The family can't see it anymore. They, Is that right? It's a red... Oh, but, uh, do you know what? It's quite funny because um, talking about transformation, my favourite film, possibly because of its script, I love Inglorious Bastards because of its script, but the, my favourite film because of its script, actually, uh, is Gladiator. Oh, yeah. And one of the reasons why I like it is because one would have said that this was a negative experience of transformation. He was a leader of a Roman legion. Mm -hmm. He, in the end, loses his life. He was a gladiator. He was killing people. Something, in actual fact, he didn't delight in. And in actual fact, he asked that question. Are you not entertained? <laughs> but there was... But he had to transform. Yeah. And he had to transform. And in the, in the beginning... He had revenge. Mm. But then he said these words. Um, he said these words, first of all, he said, because um, Commodus was saying how the soldiers ravaged your wife again, again, and again, and your son squealed like a girl. Mm. And Maximus said, the time for honouring yourself will soon be at an end and I will have my revenge in this life or the next. But mm -hmm. at the end of the movie, he kills Commodus and says these words, release the prisoners. This Rome is now again to be a republic and not run by an emperor anymore. And so what he did is the final manifestation of his goodness was remembering what Mark, Marcus Aurelius had told him. Don't you see that Rome is corrupt? It's, it's, it's no longer, it used to be run by the Senate. Mm. But because of the emperors, etc., it's become corrupt, you know. Anyway, it was funny how it became full circle. In order to take the commands of Marcus Aurelius, he had to go from being the leader of uh, uh, the legion, to be a slave under mm. Proximus, mm. then to be a gladiator in the arena, mm -hmm. to be, to, in your case, miss death twice, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? And then manifest some, what my, one, one might think years later, the command he was given by Marcus Aurelius. Mm. And once again, he became mm. the commander that he was. Mm. But don't you think that in every life we transform, maybe not as clear as in that movie, no, no. but I do, I do believe that, that we all transform one way or the other. We do, but some of us don't transcend. Okay, not everybody is... <laughs> Might sound a bit ironic, but um, if I have, if you have a life that's too comfortable and too nice and not varied enough, and then maybe you don't transform that much. So, isn't there a saying? There is a saying. It says this, and I think if I'm if I'm remembering it carefully or good, it says, um, "Good men bring good times. Good times bring weak men." Weak men bring bad times. Bad times bring good men. Yeah, a bit like that. And so, um, and that obviously goes yeah, yeah. for women and whatever else, you know. Uh, what, but what we need is sometimes we need purposeful challenge to choose the most difficult thing that we can do in terms of the heaviest responsibility we can take. Not because, not because we don't want an easy life, but because we want to remain good men. Or to develop into... In develop into, I mean, that, yes, that develop was, into, that, yes, yes, that that's right. very that's clear a... in your <clears throat> comments about the meaningfulness of life mm. and the usefulness. And that makes a lot of sense to me. Once you can develop into that, then even people like 
Mr. Hawkins, what's his first name? Richard. Stephen, Stephen Hawkins. Oh, Stephen Hawkins, yeah. Yeah, I mean, the guy <clears throat> is super restricted in his physical abilities, but mm. I mean, man, what that guy achieved with mm. in those restrictions mm. or um, that actor who played Superman and then had, was paraplegic. Christopher Reeve. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I think in some way we all have our challenges. My mom has a funny saying about that. She says everybody has a backpack. <laughs> yes, that's true. So she is of the opinion life is actually quite just in that. We all get our challenges. Mm. And even super from the outside, super successful people and uh, people where their life looks super easy, we don't look into them and, and they are details in life at all so maybe they have their own challenges in ways we can't see well, that's and right. even the, the challenge may be just if the life is too successful and not challenging enough in, in, and that, in, but the key is you see in the most successful life you've got to choose your burdens you've got to you, and that, that takes a high level of consciousness mm, it would. It, because you know Do you, I mean the question <clears throat> is of if on a subconscious level we always choose well, we have manifestations of the embodied, embodied script. So the script... So who writes the script? Well, there's a number of attribute, uh, contributors. First of all, evolution in itself and the general human, um, the human diversity that we have. Yeah. So there's a plethora, divers amounts of, of differences mm -hmm. that are embedded into the evolutionary system. Mm -hmm. Then what's manifested is obviously parents then societal and cultural, religious and ideological. And those scripts, depending on where they come from and at what time, usually between one to four, that's that time when it's most crucial that the individual child gets socialized. Because if you can't socialize that child, they don't manifest anything of, a, of whole use. They become, if a child becomes unsocialized up in between the age of four, it's very difficult to re-educate that child. So we have, it's a small percentage, but it's a significant percentage of... But what do you believe, what happens in your life? Is that determined by karma or by your thoughts and actions or by God or... What's your belief about that? I have a very clear belief in the world. Yes. Tell you afterwards. Well, I mean, I mean, you're, yeah. Okay. If you're looking for clarity for me, I'm not sure if you'll find it completely. But what I do, I do believe in the nature nurture thing. Um, that there's, there's, you know, a percentage of of life is nature. Mm -hmm. um, that means that happens without an influence of yourself. Yes, there isn't. Yeah. As a matter of fact, there is no self. Mm -hmm. uh, we aren't a blank slate. Mm -hmm. And Steven Pinker wrote a book called The Blank Slate, mm -hmm. uh, in which he shows that in actual fact manifestations of evolution are found in in every society and race, etc. Mm -hmm. and, and and it's cross-cultural. You you can't get rid of a lot of these things. <clears throat> um, uh, and I was listening to a conversation with um, Eric Weinstein. Uh, sorry, Brett Weinstein, who's the evolutionary biologist from... Uh, from um, Portland. And he said this, he said, the two things that we must become totally conscious of that will change the world, he said, um, is our need to, to have war and our need to, um, what's the other one? Uh, oh, it's war and, you know, distinguish life in mass, you know, massacring. It's something else. He called it something else. I should, should be on the tip of my tongue. And he says, we are slowly but surely becoming very, very conscious of the need to, and it is slow. We're still having wars. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, if you, if, if, if you want to talk about climate change, I think before climate change can even be a manifestation of a, of a real thing, we must stop having wars. Mm. Uh, unless we stop having wars, we, we won't do anything about the climate change. And I, I believe that to be a truth. 
Mm-hmm. You know, matter of fact, until we stop having wars, we won't annihilate poverty completely. You know, there's. I mean, I mean in, in, in some way, I have just a different way of ex, uh, ex, expressing, expressing it. it. Yeah. For, for me, it means that we haven't developed to the point where we take the value of other people's lives mm. and their quality as mm. important as our, our own. That's right. And then that is obviously a lack of sharing then is happening as a result. But I, I, but I, I am going to answer your question in a second because I, I've still got it there. But it isn't – it's one of the reasons is because we've gone back to tribal. Yeah. And here's the deal. The answer isn't – gosh, I could be hated for this, but I don't mind saying it. The answer isn't externally saying, I can do something for these people, whoever they are. It's actually me saying, what am I responsible for? And actually taking responsibility for it. You see, there are people within societies that we try and help. But people within those societies haven't taken responsibility for their themselves. Now, I'm not talking about the poor. I'm not talking about I'm talking about people who have real tools who can change. Uh, look, if I was if I was to uh, there are there are places where we've sent aid and help and everything and never touches anybody never touches the people it's supposed to. And it's a bit like our, um, there's a great chap called Steve Hughes, the comedian, and he says, you know, why do we do this these days? We say this, don't give your money to the person on the street, give it to a registered charity and we'll make sure that he gets it because you don't know where it's going. And he goes... We had had a really interesting experience with that. And he said to me, he said in this thing, he says, he said, I know exactly where it's going. It's going in his hand and he's going to the off license to get a beer. Yeah. And then they said, well, that's terrible if he's going to spend it on drink and drugs. And then Steve Hughes says, well, what were you going to spend it on? (laughs) Right. Okay. So, for instance, the guy on the street, he spends his money on a good time. Because let's face it, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm not painting everybody who lives on the street like this, but let's just say that he doesn't feel that he's got much hope. Yeah. So the thing that he does is he spends whatever money he gets right on a little now. bit of food right now, surviving, and a cigarette. Mm-hmm. What do you do with your money? Mm-hmm. You spend it on food and a good time. Mm-hmm. So let's go back to the question of what do I believe? Yeah. That is a manifestation of evolution right there. You spend your money on your food and a good time. We both want those two things. What did the hunter-gatherer do? Hunted and played. 